Hello and welcome to Under the Bonnet, ETS Stream's deep dive into the world of funds, investing and ETF. In this short podcast, we aim to understand how thematic funds are put together and how to differentiate between the growing number of funds in this space. A recent report published by Bloomberg Intelligence reckoned that within the next five years, this category of ETFs will grow to $300 billion in assets under management compared to 170 at the moment, 170 billion. Now, that's not bad for a sector that sometimes has been criticised both by people in the industry and by some academics. It's a bit gimmicky. The Bloomberg analysts reckon that one of the reasons why these are so popular is that they capture the imagination of investors who feel that they can transcend one sector and look at the big changes that happen in the global economy across a number of sectors. Uh, these sectors are traditionally defined by a term called GICs, but they quite often are a bit outdated, whereas thematic funds can cover one or two or three different sectors. In this episode, we're going to dig around inside one of the biggest categories of thematic investing, namely clean energy. Just a few minutes, I'm going to catch up with Howie Lee from LGM ETFs to understand how they build their thematic clean energy ETFs which totaled four the last time I looked, I think. But first, I'm going to catch up with an industry expert, Tom Eckett, who's the editor of ETF Stream, to get him to explain to me how popular clean energy ETFs have become and what investors should be looking out for when they understand the differences between each of these clean energy ETFs. Hi, Tom. Um, so how popular are clean energy ETFs? Yeah, like with um, most ESG ETFs, they've really grown in popularity over the past year or so. I mean, that's both in terms of assets and also number of launches. Just to, as an example, BlackRock's clean energy ETF in Europe, INRG, was in the top three inflows um, across all European listed ETFs. Um, so, yeah, so growing in popularity massively. I mean, what's driving that is probably the, the shift to sustainable investing overall. This is an important sector if the globe wants to hit the Paris agreements that were set back in uh, 2015. And also playing a massive factor was Biden's election in November. He pledged two trillion of climate infrastructure. He pledged to rejoin the Paris Agreement, which they've done, and also said that the US will be carbon neutral by 2035 and have net zero emissions by 2050. Um, a point on just ETFs and more broadly, they offer a great way for investors to an express and a view express a view and that's definitely the case with clean energy ETFs. you know they're rules-based transparent no surprises in most cases and also low fees okay so um it's interesting what you said there so effectively they're regarded as a kind of subcomponent of esg but there is a subtle difference i suppose between clean energy and esg clean energy i suppose makes a positive kind of impact point which is I'm only going to invest in businesses that are involved in the renewables or clean energy space or batteries. Whereas ESG is much more, mostly a more kind of slightly more negative thing, which is we're not going to invest in certain types of businesses. So that I suppose there is, is there a, is there a difference between clean energy, which sounds more kind of proactive and positive in an ESG framework and traditional ESG, which is more, slightly more not always more kind of you know i'll screen the universe of available companies and i'll toss out those oil companies yeah no that's a good point i mean it depends where you go on the esg spectrum of course because you've got such a range of different strategies available especially in the etf format so obviously you go as you mentioned from sort of straight exclusions which is kind of very light touch green and not having too much of an impact but some of the other some of the other sort of deeper green strategies as you get further down where say MSCI's SRI index range, they, they only take 25% of the, of the universe. So they really take a best in class approach. So that's slightly more positive green, but yeah, definitely take your point that clean energy is definitely more at the impact end of the spectrum. And are we seeing more interest in broader clean energy ETFs or, or more specific ones? So we're going to talk in a minute with, with L Jim about, They've got kind of, you know, clean water, hydrogen, battery value. So is it more investors are interested in, in kind of like a rifle shot approach of targeting particular bits of the spectrum? Or are they more interested in just capturing clean energy broadly? I think, I think yeah, I think people are going into these clean energy ETFs now. So really specific exposure 
as I just mentioned, there's been huge demand and just, yeah, BlackRock's clean energy ETFs, they saw 8 billion inflows. That's according to ETF Logic, a data provider. So they've seen huge inflows in, in recent, in, in, in the last year. And other ETF issuers in Europe have recognized that. I mean, LGM launched a strategy back in December, I believe. First Trust have launched a product. Invesco have now followed suit as well. Um, but they're all they're all doing it in slightly different ways. So it's important for investors to kind of take that into consideration. I mean, LGM, for example, have partnered with Global Data and Selective to offer their index, whereas BlackRock's product, for example, has had problems, which I'm sure we'll get onto. Yeah, absolutely. We're talking a bit about the differences between um, the, the ETFs and their indices. There's one other point as well. Uh, presumably, um, ESG is popular because, well, people are worrying about climate change and, you know, uh, there's a lot as a much more kind of individualistic kind of morally led uh, approach to investing. But presumably one of the reasons also why uh, clean energy ETFs have done well, because I've seen some astonishing numbers, the returns. I mean, I've, I've seen some quite remarkable returns on some clean energy funds. Partly because of you know because of I suppose the tech the tech bubble I suppose. Yeah, no, that's a good point. I mean, yeah, so INRG was up 136 percent last year in 2020. So that was the 136 <laughs> percent. Yeah, so that was the best. It was the best performing ETF in Europe, and it's funny because it's invested in such small companies. It's part to do with this sort of climate revolution, but also because of the huge flows that have gone into this product. It's basically been slightly bubbling the market. So the huge flows has driven the price up of all these, yeah. of all these, um, of all these individual companies. And although the performance has been really good last year, there's a big question mark as, as as to whether that can continue in the short term. Obviously, the clean energy story is here to stay, but there's definitely a question mark about the short term, the short term outlook, especially after such good numbers posted last year. I know Morningstar have done some research saying that. Any any ETF or fund that posts triple digits, you tends to, I think yeah. they said average about minus ten percent the next year. So yeah, yeah so after so it's after a, such it's a mean reversion thing, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you can't keep doing trebling every year. Just probably you, well, unless you want to get exponential growth. Um, okay, so um, so there there are lots of these different ETFs in the kind of clean energy space. In your kind of expert view, what, what should what should investors look out for the differences between them and the underlying indices? What are some of the kind of key things to watch out for? So, yeah, it's interesting because obviously clean energy ETFs, you'd, you'd presume that most are going to be very similar, but they're actually very different in their makeup. And that's, that's in terms of number of holdings and also just in terms of the stocks they're invested in. I think with any product and especially thematic ETFs in general, there's always a trade-off between the liquidity of your ETF and also the intent and the intensity of the theme. So if you want a really specific exposure, you do run the risk because they they tend to be small caps. The um the 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 individual holdings um, that offer you that pure exposure, then there tends yeah there tends to be a bit of a liquidity trade-off, and you run you can run into liquidity problems, and especially in INRG's case where they've um where they've had such big inflows. I mean, the yeah, because I mean, that, 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 it, you, that, you know, if you've got that amount of money going in, and, and if they're a, a medium to small cap business, that you know, the ETFs end up probably having a, a big yeah, on the so, a big yeah, so ETF, yeah, ETF ownership has gone up to sort of twenty five percent or so in in wow. a number of these a number of these clean energy ETFs. So if those flows reverse, there's a huge question mark. But S and P, the index provider behind that behind that strategy they've actually launched a consultation with the market which they've effectively completed now and they've proposed to treble the number of holdings from 30 to a minimum of 100 and so and effectively how they've done that is they've basically reduced the requirements to be included in the index so you don't have to be a pure play clean energy stock to be included in that index now so but although they'll be more liquid now as a result the index you invest in might not be as pure play clean energy and might um, and those individual companies might have their returns driven from other sources and other market drivers. That, that's very interesting. There's that. It's not always the case, but there's quite often the case. There's a trade off between yeah. pure play. So these are companies that are really exclusively focused on a niche and liquidity, which is you want as many stock shares on the market you can buy and sell as quickly. So there is quite often that trade off, isn't there, between the, the, your purity of your index 
and the ETF and, and the liquidity and the ability to buy and sell shares easily. Exactly. Um, and um, that's, sorry, and that, sorry, go on. I was just going to make the point about um, there's a there's a number of different ways that an ETF issuer can approach this. So you can either equal weight or market cap weight your strategy. Now you run into different challenges for each of those with market cap weight. If you do that, you you might be exposed to sort of those broad based stocks that you might not want that purity of in, um, pure in intensity of exposure. The problem is when you equal weight a strategy, this can lead to a small cap bias and again lead to those liquidity risks. A number of issuers have looked at using um, different metrics like an R number. So say the, the strength of the factor, the strength, of the intensity to clean energy, say, times market cap. And that could be an approach to sort of okay. tackle those liquidity issues. Um, and, and clean energy ETFs are, part, are a subset of a much bigger, wider uh, group of ETFs, the thematic ETFs. Have thematic ETFs proved popular over the last few years? Are people moving away from kind of your... Uh, I'm using inverted commas. You can't see me here, but I'm using inverted commas. Kind of, you know, your classic S and P 500 to thematic. And, and what do you think is driving that? Yeah, I wouldn't say it's a shift from um, the sort of broad-based products to thematic ETFs, but I think there is a shift, maybe from sector ETFs okay. to thematic ETFs. And I think the sort of JIC sectors definitely need a kind of looking at because Amazon. If you take Amazon for example, how can you put Amazon in a certain sector when it's business models is going across so many different areas for thematic ETFs. Yeah. The, the explosion has been huge. It's kind of been driven like INRG and clean energy ETFs. It's been driven by the, it's been driven over the past year. So there was, I think, according to Morningstar, there was nine and a half billion inflows last year. That was almost doubling their assets to about 22 billion. And, and it's been, yeah, it's been, it's been driven by a number of different areas of the market. Clean energy was definitely one water has started to make a big play but also the sort of digital tech ai cloud computing was another one posting big returns and yeah as i forgot to mention that these these thematic etfs have performed really well over the past year sort of they were all in the top top 10 a lot of them were in the top 10 for best performing european etfs i know cloud computing emqq and emerging markets strategy offer, offering exposure to e-commerce did about 80 odd percent blockchain did about 90 percent so these 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 strategies have really performed well recently great thanks very much tom no problem thanks david so clean energy etfs are popular uh, and they're certainly certainly speaking to a huge global shift in our energy economy and infrastructure but these big forces and global changes need to translate into something practical into easy to access funds exchange traded funds which by their very definition have to be relatively straightforward to follow or track an index. To walk us through this last practical step, I caught up with Harry Lee from Elgin to explain not only the clean energy idea as an investment idea, but also the rise of thematic ETFs more specifically. Harry, uh, welcome. And um, I just want to kick off by asking you, just for, for those out in the audience who don't really understand what a thematic ETF is, yeah, what is it? What are they? What are thematic ETFs? You know, it's a great question because I think more and more people are starting to lose sight of what certainly what we believe thematic ETFs should be. And these are pretty precision instruments where we're identifying long-term growth themes and the companies that participate in them. And so really, these are unique companies that are helping us transform our society uh, and, and what this is really bringing to, forward for us is the new economy, if you will. Um, and, and I wanted to kind of say it's really important to have that focus because we start to see people use thematic investing and sector investing in the same sentence or in the same uh, kind of article. And I think that's really important to distinguish. And, and I suppose the other distinction as well is if you classically uh, ETFs, which are part of the kind of wider passive investing revolution, you know, most people sort of started off with big, broad indices, you know, S&P 500, MSCI World, which have got hundreds, if in some cases, in the MSCI, thousands of companies. In. These are much more kind of like sniper style, aren't they? Yeah. Um, in the sense, you're, you're, you, you probably don't have a basket of hundreds, if not thousands of stocks. You have a smaller basket. Is that true? Yeah, absolutely. About certainly the way that we do it. I, I know there are other managers that do it a slightly different way and, and have broader baskets. But, you know, our our portfolios are designed to provide that precision 
into that uh, theme. And we, of course, break down the opportunity into its own classification. But the whole idea is that you can hold a portfolio such as this and then also hold alongside it a global equity portfolio you typically find. Um, and if you're an index investor, if that's S&P 500 or MSCI World or something, the, there are going to be unique holdings with low overlap um, you know, between the two. Uh, and then the other thing is, well, you absolutely picked it up already. These aren't sector funds. So you, you could, for instance, have a, uh, a an energy ETF. Yeah. And there yeah. are, in fact, um, based on big sectors like, you know, the, like the um, like S&P 500 energy or um, stocks, um, stock 600 energy. These are, again, these are not the same as sector, in, uh, sector ETFs, are they? Uh, that's right. So energy is a fantastic example. You think energy, you think oil companies, right? And that's predominantly by size. Um, they've traditionally really uh, been been powering up the whole energy sector. But of course, a lot of investors have investments to those already. And our goal, again, and going back to what I was saying earlier, is to provide precision investments into long-term growth themes. And so for us, where the transition and where the change is happening, or so-called where the new economy is, is actually in clean energy. So you know it is clean energy that is perhaps disrupting the traditional uh, oil companies. Uh, it's challenging that traditional industry, and we know with regulations uh, and everything else, there are structural changes happening here. So in the longer term, I don't think anyone would dispute the fact that there is going to be more investment and more focus on cleaner and greener ways of generating energy, but also in storing it. And you've got how many in the kind of clean energy space? It's quite a broad space. How many ETFs have you got in there? Yeah, so we kind of look at the clean energy space, um, you know, with, with, with three uh, connected lenses, if you will. We look at clean energy and in, in the generation side of things. Uh, we also look at uh, how we store that energy. So you can imagine when you look at something that are more familiar with most people like uh, pol um, solar or wind power, you need to find a way to harness and store this energy. And that's actually one of the biggest challenges. And that's why you, you know there's a lot of discussion and investments towards something like the smart grid. Um, and, and, and so the storage side is another component. And more recently, we've added a hydrogen um, as a dedicated fund because you know that in itself, there's a huge transition of gray hydrogen towards green hydrogen. And you know, there's been lots of discussion and talk about you know the the, the promise and the uh, capabilities of what hydrogen can deliver. But of course, where we are right now, 99% of hydrogen is actually produced via fossil fuel means. So there's got to be a place where this has got to transition towards a much greener way of generating it. And because hydrogen is at an earlier stage of development when you compare it to something like solar or or wind power, which is more established. Uh, we feel that having a separate tool where investors can control the risk, recognizing that there is some volatility, you know, in this uh, in, in hydrogen specifically, uh, they're able to essentially manage their risk and balance the portfolio, but still have these precision tools that they can build on their own or together with our help uh, to put together a diverse clean energy portfolio across the whole value chain. And I suppose just while we're, we're kind of riffing on the word clean, you've also got clean water, which is not quite the same space, I suppose. But but again, that, that links into the same kind of theme, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, thank you for p picking that up. So going back to what we were saying earlier, what's a sector and what's the theme? For us, the water sector, if you will, yeah, that's very well established. Those are utility companies and their business models are very much about pumping water through pipes and then essentially charging for use of that water. So think of it like a toll road. But if you move into the clean water space, actually, that's totally different. This is about transforming utility companies yeah. to full on water resource management companies. And so you've got to look at what's, what's being developed and what's contributing to that value trade chain. And that includes cleaning up the water system. And, and so you start seeing some waste and management or traditional waste management and environmental companies in there. You start seeing digital components that are developing solutions that are also helping with uh, the water industry. Uh, so again, it's about looking at the whole value chain and the economy. And so the clean water portfolio that we do is targeting how that shift and how that investment is going towards um, clean water. And so that's a much more progressive way of thinking about it when you compare it to traditional utility companies. Um, you, you said that these are more focused instruments. 
Um, now that that both has it, I suppose when people hear that, they might think there's both positives and negatives there. So positives is you get a much more concentrated portfolio. So going back to earlier point, instead of say 500 stocks in the S and P 500. I, uh, for argument's sake, you may have 50, 100, 125 stocks because it's, it's a more focused place. But I suppose the, the concern, I suppose, would be that uh, with concentration, you get more risk. I mean, that's a, uh, that, that is not always a trade-off, but that there is a trade-off there. So can these be more volatile? Can they be more risky? Just talk us through both what, why, why you'd launch these ETS giving expect focused exposure. You're obviously providing focus, but what, what else is working on underneath the, underneath the kind of bonnet here? Yeah, so it's really important to emphasize the fact that your know, diversity is still very key here. Um, a lot of investors will actually be familiar with uh, more concentrated portfolios. Um, you know, if you're used to investing in an actively managed mutual fund, uh, quite commonly you will see bigger positions and smaller portfolios than, let's say, hundreds of companies that you would find in a traditional market cap based index uh, investing, which is commonly found in ETFs. I suppose the other thing that we're very conscious of as well is that a lot of our clients actually still, from an asset allocation basis, use traditional equity building blocks. That might be uh, active based, that might be um, index based, but in any case, those portfolios are going to have very common large cap holdings. And when we say focused portfolios and precision instruments, this is us identifying and selecting through the investment process, companies that are contributing and investing in change at this space. Now, we're not going to be experts at every single area here, right? So it's really important for us to find and work with dedicated experts that can give us a view of, from a macro perspective, where the developments are headed. And once we have a strong view of where that is, and there's a multi-year growth um, attached to that theme, then it's about diving into the data uh, often proprietary to the partners that we uh, collaborate with to then handpick and build together a universe that is investable. And then we break that down into its own classification system. So as I mentioned earlier, and let's say the water, even in the clean energy side, we're breaking them down into their own classifications throughout the value chain. And so at the end of it, you, you, you come out with, let's say, a portfolio of anywhere between let's say 40 to 60 companies, sometimes less, sometimes more, depending on the theme itself. But the whole idea is that these companies are then quite focused. They can sit alongside uh, traditional equity building blocks uh, in a multi-asset portfolio and still have low overlap. But in the meantime, you're you know, widening your diversification, but also targeting your portfolio towards growth. And that's actually a really important part of, I think, how we see our investors thinking about our uh, investment I'll, instruments. I'll come back to that growth point in a second. But just just picking it, just going back to that point, uh, it, it, as, you, as you said, you've got a more concentrated portfolio. So logically speaking, would you therefore expect these portfolios to have a little bit more volatility and um, that dreadful word and te technical word as well, beta, which is, you know, you know are, are these likely to be high beta to the market? It, and, and actually just sort of hinted at it with growth. Are these likely to be thus if the markets are particularly bullish mood and talking about these big themes, these are likely to do better on average. Um, yeah, or, or is it, or is it a little bit more complicated than that? Um, I, I would say you can take a view. I think investors looking at this space, bearing in mind these are high growth themes, and yeah. and you know we look at the entire universe, right? So that includes some small caps and mid cap companies, yeah. uh, and certain themes have a little bit more bias to that. But yeah. the way we manage that risk is take normally um, on, on, on a broadly equally weighted approach. Now, we might tweak it here and there. Uh, and depending just, on the let's, let's just define that for the audience. So equal weight, because traditional indices are market cap weighted. So you know, you've got you know a really big stock worth hundreds of billions of pounds or have a bigger weighting in it than a stock worth a billion pounds. But with equal weighting, you're, it is what it sort of says it is. Each of the stocks, so if you've got 40 stocks, they're each 2.5% in, in very simple language. And that, that automatically has a bit more of a small to mid cap bias, doesn't it? It's just, it's a logical implication because you're likely to give more weight to the smaller companies by market cap. Is that right? Yeah, of course, depending on the rules and, and, and how you screen out certain companies. But yes, um, by design, the idea is to give broad diversification and each company gets its own kind of weight. And, and you no normally rebalance. So you readjust your portfolio because companies, of course, um, you know, move around their, their, their share prices. And, you know, when they grow, let's say, you know, within that six months, 
the the attractiveness of a equal weight methodology is that you lock in the gains if there are gains during that time now of course if the opportunity remains in the universe and in the basket per se uh then even if it's faced some short-term price pressure it's about topping up and having conviction to do that uh and that has worked out very well for us uh over the last eight plus years of course in various different themes um and it's a very good disciplined way of making sure you stay focused on the theme itself but not necessarily trying to pick the winners because for a lot of these themes it's too early for that um, yeah. The consolidation hasn't happened. The development hasn't been completely um, got to a point where, you know, it's consolidating. It's a lot of these are still very much in the startup to growth phase. Uh, and a lot of opportunities, in fact, are actually found in the private space waiting for IPO or waiting for m &A. You talked a bit about crossover here or lack of crossover. I, you, you probably get very different exposure than you do, say, by a, buying an S&P 500 checker. But is there any crossover with two other things that sort of jumped to mind? I suppose, first of all, ESG, um, you know, environmental, social and governance ETFs. Is there a quite big crossover with these kind of clean energy? I presume there must be some crossover. Um, and secondly, it, 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 is this not really just a kind of um, a proxy for tech stocks? Because there's a, you know, Tesla is a classic example. You know, Tesla is a classic tech stock, classic growth stock and probably fit, ticks many of the clean energy boxes. So is there also some crossover here with, with tech stocks and ESG stocks? Yeah, let's uh, let, let's tackle your, fir, your, your, your latter point there first, David. Um, you know, is this a tech portfolio? That's actually one of the most common questions that we've, got, we've received over the last seven to eight years. Um, and I think this is because if you think about almost every single industry uh, is being accelerated by the incorporation of something that is tech-based. Now, the, that, that's about how a company is utilizing that tech to then uh, further itself, not necessarily always developing that tech on its own and, and using that as the, its revenue stream. So uh, first and foremost, go back to what we were saying earlier, this is not a tech sector play. The tech sector has already been established. What we're trying to do is identify the new economies, the sectors that have not yet been classified and clean energy quite often, you know, across it, including other themes, haven't really had that defined definition yet from uh, traditional classification companies that, that do these kind of things. Uh, that tends to be more on a backward looking basis, waiting for industries to be established. So, no, this is not a tech sector basket. I'd challenge anyone to you know, pick up um, and certainly a well-designed portfolio. If you take our any of uh, the companies in our tech uh, kind of allocation, or sorry, our clean energy allocation, and then put it next to uh, let's say a tech uh, sector fund or a tech sector index, you will find low overlap and some really new and unique names in those uh, clean energy stocks that we hold. So that's the first part. Um, your other question, David, was around ESG, and I'll probably extend that to sustainability. And, and, and really, it depends on the theme itself. Now, you picked on clean energy here, and clearly the objective of clean energy, first and foremost, is to pr uh, transition into a greener future that has a lower carbon uh, footprint, and really it's about the sustainable use of resources. So by design and by objective, the industry itself gets us there. Now, some of the companies themselves may not, um, as you can imagine, you know, when you get these so-called ESG scores, uh, you know, this is an issue, of course, the whole industry is grappling with. Um, depending on the data that you use, you might have different scores for different companies. Uh, but also, and, and rightfully, some of these companies that are investing and developing in these um, innovations you know, are themselves in the process of trying to improve their own business, which would in itself, you know, over time improve E, the S, and the G scores. So that's the environmental, the social, and their governance scores. So I think, you know, you can't automatically assume that by buying any thematic fund, you would automatically get uh, an a ESG score that's better. It depends on the data that you use. Uh, it also depends on the way that the portfolio is constructed. However, from an objective point of view, and also, let's say, excluding certain investments, which actually in the European market is required um, for certain investors, you know, it, you should be, investors should really be asking, well, how are companies being excluded? And also, what is the, uh, what is the goal of the fund here itself or the objective of, of, of the fund?
Okay, so that's given us a sense of the opportunity set. The obvious next step on our journey is to work out how to put them together into an index and then a fund. Back to Howie at Elgin. Okay, so Howie, we've sort of worked our way through in our earlier discussion just about the kind of opportunity set. How do you go about building these these ETFs and the indices that are, sit underneath them? Um, we mentioned a bit earlier equal weights, but just talk us through equal weighting of the index. Just talk us through the various building blocks of these and, and, and how you, you, you set up the ETF and, and thus how the indexes emerges. Yeah, so I think first uh, of all, I'd probably highlight it takes time to do this. <laughs> uh, and this is because there is no easy way to find these universes. Um, as you can imagine, as I mentioned earlier, if you say, if you just go down the sector route, then that's easy, right? These are established industries and established businesses which have already been classified as such. So it's very easy to get a portfolio of energy companies. But to get one uh, of clean energy, and all the uh, I suppose contributors to that across the value chain, it requires essentially a lot of research, um, and, and and we call that active research where we, where we are. And and by doing that, we have to work with experts. You know, we are financial people. We're not going to be experts at, let's say, energy itself, and then also an expert at tech um, or artificial intelligence, and also an expert in logistics. We do need to work with dedicated experts to educate us, to help us form the universe, uh, but also leverage off proprietary data that they have. So a lot of time is actually searching for the right partner, searching for the right data set, searching for the right information so that we can then build and work on the appropriate thematic universe. And we do this um, you know, in a very structured way. Um, these experts that we work with are able to give us that macro guiding view of the longer term, but we need to do this bottom up as well, right? We need to research the underlying companies, uh, you know, what kind of business that they're doing, the fundamentals that they have to make sure that they are indeed in the right direction and contributing to the growth of that particular theme that we're, we're, we're targeting. So that's just identifying the thematic universe in itself. Um, after that is really around designing the investment strategy. Now we could obviously have deployed this on a completely discretionary basis, uh, but we choose to do it in a rules-based manner so that investors can see how we deploy it, how um, the rules that are set to govern it so that it comes into the universe, how much capital is allocated, i.e. how the portfolio is weighted. Um, and then again, we're quite happy to be transparent with names. So think of it as, and this is the feedback the investors give us, this is very much an approach that blends um, active by design, but also uh, index based uh, or rules based by in an execution. Uh, so that you essentially have an index that is transparent, it's dynamic and it's responsive. It can add new companies that um, are included in, in the theme. Uh, it can also exclude companies which no longer are part of that theme or have fallen away because of M&A activity. Uh, and of course, we then put that in a very simple to, to use product. Um, you know, you buy a single share or you buy a number of shares in this portfolio um, and you know, investors can trust that it's built in that way, it's researched in that way, it's run by experienced portfolio managers. And so they get a high exposure to that theme, low overlap with traditional benchmarks or building blocks um, and gives them that edge of thematic long-term growth okay, alongside the other portfolio. Let's just, just to unbundle it a bit. Let's just go through a few of them quick steps. So first of all, you equal weight them, not market cap weight them. Uh, um, not, not strictly across everything. Um, okay. And so we'll take a modified approach for each one. It really depends because there are some universes where it makes sense to, um, to, to essentially modify the weighting based on fundamentals, based on certain data that we have. Okay. So much of the time may be equal weight, but sometimes you, you do other factors. Um, yes. Then, then the, what about liquidity? Because that, that probably is an issue, isn't it? Because, you know, particularly if you've got smaller cap companies, you know, by and large, they don't have as much liquidity. And by that, we mean there's just not a lot of volume in shares to buy. And if, and if you suddenly, let's say you get your very successful thematic ETF that comes along with hundreds of millions of pounds, and let's say it's equally weighted, so 2.5% of that, suddenly you're putting a buy order in for 10, 20 million quid in a stock that may not have much liquidity. So how do you manage the liquidity bit? Yeah, 
very good question and it's a very important one. So as I mentioned earlier, the opportunity set can go anywhere from private companies, unlisted companies, to startups, small caps that have been recently been listed. We make sure that anything that in, is included in our investment universe and then into the index itself uh, that we're essentially putting money towards meets minimum requirements. So average daily uh, volumes trading, uh, looking back for the last three months, make sure that they reach a certain threshold. We also want to only invest in a certain size of companies, uh, just again, to ensure that they're able to, uh, you know, the fund can grow in size. But over the years, through the experience that we've developed, we also know that these indices or these investment strategies have to be responsive. So, you know, across all our various themes, uh, you know, we've looked and have made some changes to reflect uh, the need to and increase the liquidity or to make sure that we are able to um, increase the, you know, have the size of the fund grow, but at the same time, not affecting the opportunity too much. So, so, so let's just un so unpack that a second. So you, you might not, you might actually look at the investment strategy and say, actually, we've looked at things, maybe we'll use these rules differently. Is that what you mean? Or does it mean you just rebalance on a quarterly basis? How do you manage that inclusion exclusion? Um, yeah, so on, 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 if everything's running smoothly, you let the rules run as, as they are. If you start seeing that um, it's a little bit more challenging on certain um, names or certain companies that we're focusing on, that it necessitates and makes sense to change, then we'll work with our partners to make sure that we're highlighting the uh, liquidity nature of it uh, and the ability to buy and sell um, that fund as it grows or that, that that company as it grows. And so tweaks or changes to certain names may be made, uh, but that's not to target any specific name. That's to say, okay, well, if we're owning too much of a single company, then let's cap the amount that we own. Yeah, okay, so, let's... so classically, you, you put a cap in, yeah, okay. Um, what about, I just, sorry, just, just finishing off on this, 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 this conversation. How do you decide to include companies or not? So let, let's, let's take a classic example like Tesla. Yeah, everyone's heard of Tesla. I, I'm just picking on, you know, Elon Musk. Um, it, 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 is that in a, how do you decide that's a classic clean energy company? Is that a classic battery company? What, how, but you might have another business that may have a, I don't know, Panasonic, for instance, in batteries has a quite a big battery business. Yeah. Um, but it's not the main bit of what it does. How do you, how do you decide what to include and exclude? Because surely there are some companies that are, you know, slap bang in the middle of a definition, yeah. And then, you know, uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, if you've got a, if you've got a, for instance, if you had a lithium fund, you know, a lithium miner would be slap bang in the middle of it. But you might also worry that a Glencore, which is a diversified miner, might have a few lithium and whatever it is interest. The point I'm trying to get across is, when, how do you draw the line? Yeah, it's a good, good question. So again, bearing in mind, our approach tends to be focused on the growth of the theme rather than overweight any single company um, to, to deliver the returns. You've got to choose companies based on a certain criteria and they've got to contribute to the growth of the space. We often ask, let's using the, the battery fund that we have around energy storage, uh, the, the, the easiest analogy to use is probably electric vehicles. And people would say, oh, you know, there's lots of increased um, uh, promotion of uh, EVs uh, across the world. Uh, more and more manufacturers are building electric vehicles. So maybe we should all just invest in every single car manufacturer that's, you know, participating in that space. Uh, but no, that's not what we do. Uh, what's important is focusing who's producing the batteries. Okay. So, you know, Tesla, as you mentioned, are producers of batteries but also producing them to commercialize elsewhere. They're, they've got revenue streams where they're deriving specifically off their battery, not just the sales of their vehicles. Same with a company like Samsung SDI, again, um, big leaders in uh, lithium ion batteries. Uh, they actually used to supply uh, BMW, for example, in their electric vehicles until BMW decided to produce it for themselves. So again, it's making sure that you're developing this technology, not just for self-use, but developing it to commercialize to benefit the wider ecosystem uh, and, and so that's a, a pretty important way of distinguishing things but everything will always come back to you can't just pick companies and say well that feels like it's right it feels like that should be part of the universe 
we actually, before we even look at the companies, we classify the universe into a classification system first. And each theme is going to be different. For energy storage, it's important to look at you know, lithium producers, but also energy storage technology providers. Um, and then you can go into something like hydrogen. And again, that, that will look very different again. It's all about making sure that we're classifying each individual theme bespoke to how it's uh, being developed and how it's being built. So in hydrogen, it's fuel cell manufacturers, it's key component suppliers, it's um, integrated supply chain players, it's also you know, heavy mobility usage down, down the line, but also who's creating and who's developing electrolyzer that are used for um, uh, uh, hydrogen. And, and here specifically, actually, the electrolyzers are lithium companies, as or the lithium electrolyzers as opposed to the eight alkaline ones. Right. So now we have an index, and off the back of that, we have a fund, or in this case, a series of funds. The devil, as always, is in the detail. How do you make sure that the fund not only stays in the front of people's imaginations and minds and plans, but also it stays accurate and useful? Okay, so we've got a good idea about the opportunity set. We've got a good idea about um, uh, how that, that opportunity set is turned into an index and then turned into an ETF. Let's just, just, just probe a little deep, deeper on just a couple of practical questions. Um, when people are buying thematic ETFs, what are the kind of, what's the kind of classic questions they should ask and look out for? What are the differences between different providers? What's, what would be your kind of top three things that they should ask of their, of their thematic ETF provider? I think they need to understand why they're um, investing in themes first and foremost. And if they're investing it for growth and it, they're still going to hold traditional equity portfolios, then the first thing to look at is overlap.